Well, thank you all for joining us. And as, as, as people arrive, I'm very pleased to welcome you to this um, actually first uh, session for this academic year of our monthly workshops that make part of the Migration Working Group of uh, Ryerson and the CERC, the Canada Excellence Researcher in Migration and Integration. I'm Anna Trendafelidou, and I'm very pleased to kickstart this series with a, a really interesting and important topic, which is the use of indicators in the governance of cultural and religious diversity. And although one might say, oh, this is not strictly speaking a migration topic, I think it's a very important topic that brings together migration and migrant integration. Um, I'm, I'm particularly pleased today for bringing together two, um, two large projects that we have been in contact with and collaborating with and that have tried to use, have recently are just now um, constructing sets of indicators to to assess how cultural and religious diversity is being measured and is being governed and to try to measure that um, across the world and i think it is a particular challenge to try and construct indicators that can be applicable not only in different countries but in different world regions and in different continents and this is one of the issues that we're going to be looking at today um, partner here with Kundan Mishra from the Global, uh, the Global Center for Pluralism in Ottawa that is doing some very important work in bringing together experiences, policies and practices from around the world on pluralism as a practice and as a, as a norm and as a, if you want, as, a, as an endpoint, as, as a situation to which we want to arrive at through governing our, our cultural and, and religious diversity. And also my colleagues from uh, Horizon 2020 European project that is called Greece, nothing to do with the musical. It's about the governance of religious diversity and whether secularism is the appropriate um, principle, but also set of policies in, in addressing religious diversity. And both of these, um, I mean, projects, as I said, bring together countries from for instance, Asia or the Middle East with Europe and North America, trying to see how these indicators can work in different settings. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce my um, the colleagues, Kundan Mishra from the Global Center for Pluralism and Lili Yakova and Rosica Zekova from the Center for the Study of Democracy in Sofia, who are one of the partners of the Greece project. Um, and after, after they conclude their presentations, I'll have a chance to, to introduce our formal discussions and of course then invite you participants for your questions and comments. Um, just one housekeeping um, I guess a suggestion is please feel free to write your comments and questions in the chat box. The chat box is, box is visible to all. And once we finish with the presentation and the formal discussions, I will pick up from there the questions and comments um, and uh, um, introduce them to the speakers and ask them to react. So thank you very much. Uh, Kundan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Anna. Thank you for the wonderful introduction, and I'm glad to be part of this forum. So just to give you a brief overview of the presentation here, uh, I will talk about a brief background of the index, the framework highlights from the pilot in 2019, um, and we'll move on to some key considerations for comparative analysis. Uh, why the pluralism index? What is the need for uh, a pluralism index? Uh, diversity is a social fact. All societies are diverse in one way or another, uh, whether it is along the lines of uh, indigeneity, migration, religion, ethnicity. Yet most of the societies struggle with, um, with a positive engagement with diversity. And in some cases, in extreme, uh, uh, extremely unfavorable cases, uh, this struggle leads to problems like xenophobia, nationalism, social fracture, uh, and often violent conflicts at the regional as well as uh, internal level. Uh, pluralism uh, as a lens is uh, rooted in the concepts of recognition and belonging. And will, uh, and uh, it is very important when we are trying to understand diversity and a diverse society to know how diversity is recognized and treated through formal, legal, and institutional means and through efforts of policy and practice. 
this is what we mean uh, by recognition. And by belonging, what we uh, try to capture is whether and to what extent people in society feel like they and others belong. And there's a larger connect of, uh, of this issue of pluralism and inclusion to sustainable development goals as well, whereas DG 16 ex explicitly talks about inclusion and acceptance in diverse societies. Um, why did we need a plural, pluralism index? First of all, there are very limited uh, existing tools um, very practically none that capture pluralism in a holistic way, which looks at social, political, economic uh, aspects of life and, uh, and the challenges faced by diverse groups in a complex society. And uh, the idea was uh, to capture what does pluralism look like in practice and how do practitioners and policymakers know if they are advancing pluralism in their work. Here we felt that a lens towards engagement with diversity in a society uh, that looks at institutions and their practices as well as individual behavior, you know, the hardware and the software of a society uh, will be very, very uh, useful uh, to, to capture trends in group inclusion and exclusion. Uh, and there was a clear need for a tool to monitor and assess the state of pluralism with benchmarks that look at plural, pluralism, not in isolation, but holistically across all dimensions of society. Uh, I can, and, uh, sorry to interrupt you there. Uh, we're just having sure. a, a slight technical, technical difficulty with your slides here. Um, would you mind just unsharing? Um, it seems to be frozen on this opening. Sure thing. Let me try that. Uh, and I can share from mine if it's. If you wanted to share once more. Yeah. Okay. And then just to the, the slides, slide share view. Yeah, this is in the slide share view. Is this working? I can go uh, back. Okay, so it's moving for us now. And then if you could just click on the, the full screen view for the icon at the bottom there, right? Yeah, I think this is the full screen view. Um, is that That's better? Presenter view and slideshow. There we go, perfect. Is that better? Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, so going back to uh, our discussion, uh, the a key or two key engagements that pluralism index looks at is analysis of gaps in terms of group inclusion and analysis of trends, both within a country over a period of time and hopefully uh, uh, comparing two countries which may have similar contexts or different contexts and uh, what are the key barriers or key progresses in terms of group inclusion and exclusion. Now we'll move on to uh, the key design elements uh, of the pluralism index assessment. Uh, the first was to highlight uh, both positive and negative trends. Uh, we know that some societies are making deliberate efforts towards inclu being inclusive and to identify what is the movement around policies and practices in such societies. Um, the second was uh, to, to really look at hardware and software uh, aspects of a society as well, where we look at institutional institutions and what exists as well as how uh, how policies and practices, as well as individual behaviors, shared cultural histories play a role in, uh, in group inclusion and exclusion. The third was, as I said, to extend a holistic lens towards, uh, towards practices uh, and policies of group inclusion um, and really look at assessment in a contextual way. And what I mean by that is to, to situate assessments in the history, in the current 
context of a country and not keep it isolated from the developments that are ongoing, from the progresses that the country may have made over the years. And finally, uh, to clearly identify policies and practices for better engagement with uh, other stakeholders. This is the assessment framework that we used during the pilot. As you can see, this comprises of five uh, dimensions and 15 indicators. Uh, these five dimensions include legal commitments, practices, group-based inequalities, intergroup relations, and belonging. And uh, the, the slide is uh, very self-explanatory in terms of what are the key themes we are looking at within these uh, dimensions. Uh, but let me just add that this was the framework that we used during the pilot. And since then, uh, we have integrated a lot of learnings from the pilot and uh, we have a new framework with some few uh, more additions uh, that we, we are planning to implement in our 2020 assessments. Uh, now, a brief word about the methodology. We use an expert assessment method methodology uh, where we have two expert assessors in a country uh, and a reviewer uh, who work together uh, with the country level assessment. The questionnaire that I shared earlier is largely used to assess the country across the five dimensions and 15 indicators. And uh, both assessors and reviewers continuously engage to make sure uh, that, uh, that the all the methodology and the data sources are highly reliable, consistent across all reports, and identify the key trends that need immediate attention. Now, assessors provide a score and narrative for each of the 15 indicators. And if there are any differences or conflict in opinion, then uh, the reviewers facilitate a dialogue between the assessor uh, to reconcile any difference of opinion. Finally, uh, we also do, uh, we also collect primary data on, on perceptions of trust and belonging, especially around intergroup trust and intergroup belong and uh, belonging, not intergroup belonging. Uh, that's largely because in a lot of cases we note, we noticed that uh, there was a real dearth of primary data along uh, along trust and belonging. While generalized trust uh, does exist in sources like, uh, like World Value Survey or Afrobarometer, intergroup trust is really difficult to pin down. And uh, we thought it was a very valuable contribution to make uh, and to put our efforts behind that. Uh, like I said, the index pilot was conducted in three countries, Canada, Germany, and Kenya. The idea behind choosing these countries uh, was to have a geographical uh, variation. Uh, and since the pilot was largely a proof of concept, we wanted to see whether the questionnaire and the assessments are, uh, can be implemented in an efficient way uh, in different contexts. Uh, going forward in 2020, we are looking at assessing uh, six more countries. Uh, and uh, I must also uh, mention that uh, in subsequent rounds, we will, uh, we will assess a country over a gap of two years uh, just to make sure that uh, we are not being repetitive and still capture any important trends uh, in terms of in group inclusion or exclusion. Uh, now to share the, some of the key highlights, uh, I would really urge you to uh, pay attention to both uh, the narrative as well as the score. The scores uh, being very brief to have a tendency to capture attention immediately, uh, but they must be uh, interpreted in terms like in, uh, they must be interpreted along with the narrative that that accompanies the score. Uh, I won't read through all the findings just uh, to be economical with time and I will skip Canada because the next uh, forum talks about Canada in detail. Uh, but here I would uh, definitely talk about the Germany and Kenya finding and some of uh, the key variation in scores. Again, in terms of international commitments, all three countries had more or less signed on to a lot 
of uh, international uh, instruments, conventions, treaties. Uh, but a key exception was the ILO convention around tribal and indigenous people that Germany and Kenya had not signed on. Uh, even in terms of uh, constitutional commitments, why Germany, uh, German assessors scored uh, a six for Germany is because they found a lot of variation in terms of how landers or the provincial governments in Germany implement uh, the constitutional provisions. And uh, they found a clear divide between, East, between provinces in Eastern Germany and Western Germany, uh, which really uh, were a challenge for the constitutional commitments towards non-discrimination and inclusion. Uh, and similar uh, concerns feed into the national instruments as well. Uh, that's where German assessors felt that while a Grun Gazettes or uh, the basic um, uh, basic rights cover a set of non-discriminatory rights and privileges, uh, but they they don't go all the way, especially with the changing demographics in Germany um, and uh, fresh concerns around Islamophobia and threat to uh, migrant groups. In terms of uh, efforts and practices, again, uh, here we really try to look at how, how are the constitutional commitments or national level commitments being implemented in practice. And again, uh, in terms of uh, Germany, like data protection regulations make potential inequalities or discrimination of some subgroups mostly invisible in official data. Uh, the collection around group uh, group based data uh, and regulations around it which make which make it very difficult for uh, data collection of specific group or group uh, group disaggregated data uh, it which renders vulnerable groups or uh, or other minority groups mostly invisible finally the Sorry, and the third domain is group-based inequalities. Again, in terms of Germany, they they were really trying to highlight the trends around uh, around migration, that migrants are uh, really being left behind, uh, and uh, they 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 face strong they face very strong challenges in terms of political participation and in, and economic equality they are at a higher risk of unemployment and uh, and poverty almost twice than the regular uh, than the uh, remaining population and they the assessors also looked at or also highlighted concerns like uh, ethnic dis uh, they use the term ethnic penalties, uh, where things like uh, there was a study uh, where a Turkish, uh, where a woman from a Turkish background who wears a hijab has to apply almost 4.5 times, uh, um, has to send at almost 4.5 times more applications than a white German woman uh, who, uh, to get the same number of interview callbacks. Uh, finally, uh, going towards the intergroup relations and belonging. Uh, as you can see, the last uh, point really uh, brings us to the, to the kind of findings that this assessment can highlight. Uh, more than 80% respondents love Germany, but only 60% respondents with migrant back background feel German. So there is a dissociation between uh, the idea of a national identity and feeling belonged in a society. And uh, this is the kind of uh, finding that uh, the assessment can really put forth. Again, not going uh, into the details of the Kenya findings because we'll find similar things along the lines of ethnicity. Uh, but I would like to highlight that group disaggregated data continues to be a concern. Now, uh, we understand that countries don't uh, make public or don't collect group disaggregated data at all for various historical reasons. Uh, but we do believe that uh, this kind of data takes us uh, closer to addressing group inequalities in an efficient way. <clears throat> now, I would, what I would like to do is really spend some time around considerations for comparability that we faced through these assessments. Uh, and the first one was 
how to represent scores for a specific diversity group. Considering that diversity is uh, so fluid and varies from country to country, uh, how do we identify diversity groups as, uh, as core of the assessment process? And how do we say uh, that, like in, in Canada, for example, maybe the core diversity groups are my, uh, migrants, indigenous uh, communities or peoples, and uh, and let's say racial minorities. Uh, and these three groups may not be exported as it is to other contexts. Uh, uh, so how do we compare uh, diversity groups in Canada to diversity groups in Kenya? Uh, the second key challenge is comparison over time or comparison among countries. Now with these three pilots, we found a value in both. Uh, but what the assessors really do is try to calibrate the score or contextualize the score to their own country. What I mean by that is if, if Germany has not had uh, any hate crime for last five years and suddenly faced four hate crimes this year, then they may uh, put, put uh, a higher score towards group-based, uh, you know, towards, let's say, claims making uh, scores. Uh, whereas Kenya, if they had, they already had a longer history of ethnic violence, uh, things may not look that uh, worrisome uh, with the score. So that is something that uh, we continue to orient our assessors towards. And there's, there are both advantages and disadvantages of that kind of approach. Um, Finally, what would a global score really represent? What would we mean by a global score for pluralism? Does it mean a global score for uh, pluralism or a global score towards inclusion of migrants or a global score towards inclusion of indigenous people? How, how do we approach and position that? And this is an, uh, this is, uh, an alive concern um, and we would like to uh, hear more from the wider audience group. And finally, it's, uh, we are being very deliberate and uh, very, uh, very focused towards asking people to interpret scores of a country with the narrative ass assessment report, because the narrative is where we can highlight a lot of nuances where, uh, that an individual score cannot. And I think I'll stop there. Uh, and thank you so much for, uh, for this platform. Thank you very much, Kundan. This is very interesting, just uh, so challenging to try and compare um, uh, Germany, Kenya and Canada, three countries that are admitted, admittedly quite different in their socioeconomic and political outlook. Um, and, and thank you very much. This, the, I think this adds a lot of food for thought and I'll, I'll pass uh, the floor to Libby and Rosica on the Greece indicators. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Lily, and I hope you can see my screen. Um, okay, so together with my colleague Rusica from the Center for the Study of Democracy, we'll present uh, the Greece indicators, or also the so-called state religion governance indicators. Uh, and we will also present some uh, comparative insight results uh, from data we collected by applying these indicators. Uh, just quickly before we speak about uh, the indicators, uh, what the Greece project is. As Anna mentioned, that's a Horizon 2020 initiative. Um, it's funded by the European Commission, but in its scope, the project is global. Um, it's coordinated by the European Union Institute, uh, but there are partners uh, on the consortium from all kinds of places from different continents. So it's a really multicultural project. And the goal of the project is to investigate uh, how religious diversity is governed in different cultures, how religious minorities are integrated in those cultures, and to intersect these processes with uh, processes of violent, religiously inspired radicalization, encountering such radicalization in different parts of the world. So it's quite a big, massive project. Um, as uh, part of this project, our task was to create state religion governance indicators. And the major goal of these indicators uh, is to transform complex knowledge 
um, to turn it into basically a toolkit which can be used by practitioners, policymakers, experts, so that they can uh, assess trends in different countries and monitor developments on four major aspects, state religion relations, uh, governance of religious diversity, violent radicalization, and efforts to address it. So in a nutshell, what we did was create this indicator toolkit. Uh, it's made up of four composite indicators uh, and their dimensions. And on this slide, you can see the four composite indicators and um, a very brief explanation of their dimensions. You can notice here that the first two indicators relate to um, more the topic of religion and re its relationship to the state, religious institutions, uh, and the connection to the state, also religious minority groups, how they're managed, uh, how diversity of, uh, is managed. And then the second two indicators focus more on the radicalization aspect, with the third one uh, focusing mostly on the factors which contribute uh, or contextualize processes of violent radicalization, and the fourth one measuring uh, radicalization prevention. So how did we come up with these indicators? It wasn't an easy task. Uh, we did a read of uh, the literature, uh, academically speaking, we looked at existing indices on these um, different topics. We were in um, a very long consultation with the consortium partners. So eventually we came up with these four composite indicators. And when we created the toolkit, we applied the toolkit to 23 uh, different countries around the world. And eventually Canada was added. So we can probably later hear a little bit more about Canada. But what we did for each of the different indicators when we applied them to the countries, uh, we, we used different methods uh, and sources as you can see here on this slide, uh, for the first, second, and the fourth indicators, we relied on expert assessments from um, the partners on the consortium, as well as desk research. So the different partners looked at legal policy documents, research reports, media reports. And then with the third indicator, it was a little bit different. In addition to the desk research, um, we also relied on survey data, especially about perceptions, attitudes, and experiences of people uh, in relation to radicalization. We also, for this indicator, relied very much on pre-existing global indices and country scores. And here we have given some examples, but these are not the only ones. We used quite many. So after we applied these indicators to all these countries, uh, we came up with some results. Uh, and um, before reporting some comparative results, uh, we want to be clear about some limitations and caveats that um, came up during our analysis. Uh, what we are presenting here uh, are data from the most recent years for which actually we had data available. Uh, meaning from 2015 to 2020. The initial goal is to present data from 2000 to 2020, but for some uh, sub-indicators, uh, there were missing data in some measures. And uh, yeah, that's why we made this choice to present more recent data for the last five years. Uh, the numbers which we'll present now uh, for the composite indicators are uh, basically scores which are aggregated from several measures relating to different aspects within each composite indicator. This means that uh, we are quite aware that such quantification may miss out on important nuances and contextual differences. So we always keep this in mind that um, there may be other explanations that are not um, reflected in the scores. So let me talk briefly about composite indicators one and two, and just to explain to you what the logic of these indicators is. Um, to begin with composite indicator one, it measures the autonomy and freedom of religious institutions and groups from the state. This one is based on eight sub indicators and you can see some of the sub indicators on the right hand side. Um, each of these sub indicators uh, is based on two measures 
a legal measure and a practical measure. So the goal of the legal measure is to look at the legislation, uh, basically uh, the constitution or the most important religious laws and to see how the particular sub-indicator is, is doing in the legislation or how the legislation really speaks about the sub-indicator. And then uh, the practical measure measures how things are in practice. So in a sense, we created each sub-indicator uh, with the legal and practical measures so we can compare how each of them is. And the logic for composite indicator two, uh, which measures the status of and the rights of religious minority groups is very similar. Again, consisting of uh, sub indicators with legal and a practical dimension for, for each. I will report on some comparative insights, uh, which we uh, came across for composite indicator two, measuring the level of rights of religious minorities. Here we, now, uh, aggregated the scores, uh, and, and basically we are taking into consideration a Likert type scale. So with one being very low on level of rights, and five being the highest, very high on the level of rights. And this is just an excerpt for some of the countries uh, in Europe, and we have included Canada here. And what we observe across the board, not just for Europe, but for pretty much almost all the countries on the Greece project, is that for this uh, composite indicator, the legal dimension scores seem to be higher than the practical dimension scores, meaning that in terms of legislation, um, there is supposed to be a high level of rights for religious minorities, but in fact, practice does not always confirm this. And of course, as you can see here in the results, um, there are some exceptions to this rule. Bulgaria, for example, France, the UK, uh, and even in these exceptions, uh, the discrepancy between the legal and the practical dimension is not um, that big. You can see here for Canada, the scores are pretty high. Maybe we can discuss later why this is the case. And now for the sake of time, I'll just give the floor to my colleague uh, who will talk about radicalization. Hello. So let's turn our attention to just a second to the indicators that deal with radicalization. And uh, just a note on the context of why we developed this indicator, uh, why we focus on radicalization. Basically, the idea was not to develop indicators on radicalization that be, can be used on their own to assess the issue, but rather in the context of the entire project. And as my colleague mentioned already, deals with states, uh, religion, um, relationships, the governance of religion and diversity. So the idea was to answer our main research questions that uh, focused on how different models of state religion um, governance relate to radicalization. So it's kind of a supportive um, set of indicators within that bigger topic. So a few notes on um, the concepts we use because we started by a very um, kind of detailed concept um, um, brief uh, developed by our consortium and conceptualization of the main terms, uh, how we understand radicalization, violent extremism, because as you know, radicalization is very contested, both in academia, but also in prac among practical circle uh, practice practitioners. So it's important to kind of explain first what we mean by that. So we focus on religiously motivated um, radicalization, violent extremism, understood as the promoting, supporting, or, or committing acts of violence, including terrorism, by an in-group against an out-group, to achieve religious goals. And this is associated with the articulation of religious ideas within violent extremist frameworks. So we started thinking, how can we op operationalize this con concept uh, so that we can even begin to kind of pin down different factors that are relevant in assessing trends related uh, to, to violent extremism and radicalization. So basically we have three dimensions that we, um, based on our theoretical framework we use that we find relevant. 
So first of all, socioeconomic and structural conditions are important, but not by far not sufficient when we talk about drivers or factors that um, are relevant in the context of radicalization violent extremism. It's also important to look at the social experiences and how such socioeconomic and structural material conditions are experienced, interpreted by different social groups, and this is in what we call expressed through what we call grievances, different types of grievances. And thirdly, these types of grievances need to be kind of met or structured or mobilized by different ideological frames, mobilizing networks into violent extremist narratives or actions. So composite indicator tree uh, tries to kind of reflect this concept or in these dimensions into the uh, sub indicators we try to measure. Um, again, a note, um, compared to the first set of indicators we heard about um, uh, on, uh, from the Global Pluralism Index, here we're not working with primary, we're not collecting primary data. We largely rely on already pre-existing indices, global indices, but also um, uh, but also uh, survey data that's already uh, available, um, global data, or regional data from different surveys, attitude surveys and polls. So the first dimension, as I said, uh, refers to the broader conductive environment. We call them structural factors or drivers, basically contextual factors that may, may or may not give rise to individual and groups content. And here we look at eight measurements um, based on global indices, such as um, that deal with economic inequalities, with government restrictions on religion, state legitimacy, civil liberties, human rights, and others um, based on indices such as the fragile states index or more precisely different aspects of it, different components of it, uh, the freedom in the world index, and some others. The second dimension, we called it perception-based dimension. It also measures eight sub-indicators. So it aims to capture in a more direct way the social experience and interpretation of the structural factors, which can be expressed through different political, economic grievances, social polarization, and discontent, including discomfort with minorities, in particular religious minorities, discrimination, both experienced and perceived, but also um, views on violent extremism, uh, in particular threat perception. And the final dimension, uh, we call that incidence-based. Um, this one is very, very difficult to pin down and to capture. And we had initially, in the initial set of indicators that we derived from, from the theory, from the literature, a much larger set of indicators that we wanted to uh, to apply, but during the piloting and testing period, it turned out that data will be very difficult to, um, to kind of collect um, data that will be reliable and comparable as well. So just a glimpse into some of the results we have, um, and I'll focus on the perception-based based dimension of this composite indicator, because it's uh, in a way a bit uh, kind of more, more um, related to what we've heard and what we're going to hear later. So basically here we, we, uh, uh, we um, calculated them based on uh, perception surveys. So uh, these numbers are presenting percentages. And we have several pillars where we try to capture different types of grievances and uh, aspects of, um, of, of perceptions that we find relevant. Like the first pillar here, I just um, pulled out just the data for Europe, um, but I also added Canada. Uh, in Europe, we do have quite uh, a lot of data that's also comparable because it comes from the same source and it's uh, based on the same, on the same methodology. That was not really the case outside Europe, although we do have some data, but it's um, a lot uh, more is missing. Uh, so focusing on Europe, the first pillar deals with uh, political and economic grievances. We did the composite measure for this. So basically here we have a lot of uh, several sub measures like people's dissatisfaction with uh, democracy, distrust in their government, um, dissatisfaction with their own financial situation or with the country's economy. Um, and based on this, we compose the score. So what we see here is that across Europe, let's say, uh, let's say Greece has its highest score. So behind this course, however, there are different narratives. So different types of uh, conditions uh, can explain that, like uh, prolonged economic crisis, political and social distress in some of the countries. So we always underline that it's important to also 
um, as the speaker before us uh, mentioned, to read through the narrative. And we do have narrative reports for all of the countries where we applied uh, the indicators. The second pillar is discomfort with minorities. And here we focus in particular on uh, Muslims um, because the entire uh, um, project and the indicators um, are focusing a lot on religious issues. So we hear discomfort with minorities related basically to social distances concerning Muslims. So what's interesting here is to see that we see the highest scores of such discomfort in Central and Eastern European countries, um, uh, such as Lithuania and Slovakia, um, which is also uh, correlates to the next pillar, which is the perceived discrimination. Um, perceived discrimination, basically the percentage of people who think that discrimination is widespread. And here again, we have the lowest the lowest uh, kind of perceived uh, discrimination in Central and Eastern Europe. And that's why the narrative behind this is so important because um, grievances are very hard to pin down and perceptions are, need also to be contextualized. Like for instance, uh, with, in this case, Central and Eastern European countries that show this kind of high and low scores are actually the ones with the uh, smallest Muslim minorities. Um, so it's kind of part of um, understanding the debate in these countries and the discrimination is not part of the public and political debate. It's actually the opposite that in, um, in, some, in some of these countries, actually, um, the public and uh, political debate is very polarized and very um, kind of focusing on hate crime even um, and, 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 and dividing lines. So the next pillar, it's experienced discrimination. And here we have excellent data from the Eurobarometer surveys for Europe and some other sources from uh, for countries outside Europe. So basically the first number shows experienced discrimination uh, among uh, the general population and the number in brackets, um, the experienced discrimination among certain minorities. They are different for each country, um, depending on which the the most relevant minorities are for this country. So here it's important to look as well at the discrepancies um, between these two scores because um, they can tell us an, an important story as well. And the final, um, and here when we look at the numbers, for instance, um, the experience discrimination among the general population is highest in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, but uh, experience discrimination among minorities is highest in countries like Greece, France, um, and Slovakia. And the final pillar deal, deals with violent extremism threat perception, basically to what extent people think that religious uh, violent extremism is a problem uh, or a threat in their country. And we see here in most of Europe high scores, so well above 50% of the population having such a high threat perception, which again, this data um, com is, uh, most of the data presented here is from the years 2017, 18, 19. So of course, this needs to be viewed in the context of debates, counterterrorism measures being applied across Europe and the aftermath of attacks or generally the, the public discourse on, on the issue. Uh, the final dimension, we called it, as I said, incidence-based dimension in here. Um, basically, we wanted to capture um, the incidence and the impact of religiously motivated violence uh, and intergroup group conflict, including terrorism. Um, and we used, we ended up using two main scores which rely on pre-existing indices. Basically social hostilities is the dark orange um, on the bar chart and the light orange is um, the incidence and impact of terrorism, uh, which comes from the global terrorism index, which um, all of you will probably be familiar with. So, um, so we we think that actually the social hostilities index, the social hostilities index, it's uh, developed by the Pew Research Center, is much broader and uh, comes a bit closer to the conceptualization of violent extremism that we have in the theoretical framework, uh, because terrorism is only one aspect of that index. It captures over 20 subscores, which deal with uh, different types of violence, individual and group um, violence um, motivated by religious hatred, but also communal violence, uh, mob violence, um, hate crimes, uh, so a lot of different aspects um, focused on, on uh, religious violence. So here again, um, 
they are in, uh, we have uh, put the data out for the entire sample um, of uh, the countries we covered. Canada is actually on the social hostilities index uh, has a relatively low score. It's similar to uh, Australia's score, 2.4. I, I haven't managed to put it on the, on the graph. Uh, but here again, it's important to kind of unpack this further. Like for instance, in Europe, there are some high scores and they have been because the data, the social facilities index is from 2017. This needs to be considered when we interpret this course. Um, across Europe, there has been a, a increase in this index across many, um, uh, many countries in Europe. Uh, and this is of course related to the response to major terrorist attacks, the entire debate, counter-terrorism debate, new measures being put into place and generally religious minorities becoming much more kind of the focus of such measures. But also uh, in countries like Germany and some others, um, this captures also the um, kind of far-right movements and their reactions and their kind of um, different demonstrations and violence perpetrated by fire art groups um, within the anti-migrant uh, anti and uh, anti-Muslim debate. So this is reflected uh, as well in this course, while outside Europe, some of the high scores are attributed more to communal violence or state-based armed conflict involving religion um, and different, different, um, different dimensions. So, um, Rosa, yeah, with that, yeah, I'm, I'm finishing. To conclude, we're grossly over time. Yeah, sorry, I'm finished. I, I finished. Uh, yeah, just this was just a brief overview. If you want to know more about the indicators, you can uh, go on the website of the Greece Project. We have, as I said, the narrative reports for each of the countries, uh, as well as the, as the country scores. So we'll be happy to provide more information in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. I realize it's a challenge to, uh, to pr uh, present such rich data in a short period of time and certainly the online modality makes things a little uh, more complicated. Um, let me ask uh, our formal discussants to, to come in here and give us some insights about uh, the usefulness, uh, if you want the validity, the reliability of these indicators. Um, some of the issues raised already by Rosica and Lili and Kundan. For instance, do you always need a narrative assessment to justify the score? How much uh, can we trust experts? Does it become too burdensome? And many other questions. So our two discussants are Andrea Wagner, who works in Back Economics AG in Switzerland, but was an advisor to the Intercultural Cities Project, uh, a large project that started in Europe and has grown international, bringing together cities who wish to engage with interculturalism um, and with uh, dealing with diversity, uh, and which is sponsored by the Council of Europe. And also Giacomo Solana, who I understand is the methodological mastermind behind a lot of the work that is now being done for the new round of the MIPEX indicators. The MIPEX indicators are, uh, MIPEX stands for Mi Migrant Integration Policy Indicators. And correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's the longest uh, living, the more sustainable um, effort to provide for indicators that, uh, that assess the governance of diversity. So we hope to get the insights from Andrea and, and, and Giacomo's experience to speak to us about uh, the Greece Project Indicators and the Global Pluralism Index. So Giacomo, and because our speakers took a bit more time, please, uh, the two discussants try to keep it uh, within the time agreed. Um, sorry, no, Giacomo is not first, Andrea is first, Andrea. Hi, hello everyone. Uh, thank you very much for this kind introduction. And I would like to thank to have the opportunity to, to comment here. And I want to thank the speakers for the very interesting presentations. And I think there has been a tremendous work done to collect all these information data and transforming them to indices. The results uh, bring our already a lot of insights for the respective countries and indications for improving governance. There could be a lot of that on the results of the respective or the individual results of the countries, but I would like to comment on some measurement issues. First, general from going from the concept to the indicators and secondly, from the kind of indicators and their significance. 
to the first one, narrative report its case studies and peer reviews, as it has been done here, are very rich in content and detail, and policymakers, I think, can learn a lot of it. But comparison and communication is all, always difficult with only case studies. For that, composite indicators and indices are very popular for communication and comparison. But then we have to accept simplification and quantification. That's a price we have to pay in a way. If you look at the level of complexity of the two works presented, the level is different, I think. I think the Greece indicators focus on religious diversity, which is clearly or almost clearly defined scope, although, we are, although here we can think about certain group, more groups of religious groups of uh, what, what our religious groups should be addressed. But the scope is, I think, clearly defined. And there is a clear set of indicators with already a very detailed description of each scoring. The scope of the global pluralism index is per se because it wants to cover diversity in a holistic way, it's a very ambitious uh, task to do. Now, there are peer reviews, which really provide a lot of information. And there is also a catalog of areas and questions. However, to construct here a comparable index across time and across countries, I think it's extremely demanding, cost intensive and time intensive. The scores of the developed indicators focus similar problems that, that are common problems of constructing indicators or composite indices. There have to be a quantification to, or to reach a comparable and stable index. There have to be a very detailed metrics, quantification of every aspect and question. And I think it's not enough to have an overall score done by, one, uh, by experts for a whole area, because then it gets very difficult to, to um, give also recommendations. What are, or let me say it in another way, a country want to know, what, if, I, if I do this action, does it improve or does it deteriorate my score? if I have scores. If I have no scores, I think it's more like I can do recommendations which are very uh, contextualized. But if I have numbers, I have to make sure that if uh, countries take actions, I have to improve or to, um, to deteriorate. And then it has also comparable to other countries. And then I have to define similar groups or similar historical contexts that each country can learn from another country what are the actions better there or not. But for that, I really need a very detailed catalog um, for each country. And the second problem, I think, is how, how should we um, aggregate the different indicators? There is always subject of discussion how to weight and how to aggregate them, and there will always be um, people disputing about that. I think that's not a problem, but I think it has to be to make very clear, it has to be addressed, how do we aggregate this uh, several aspect and what are the real driving indicators behind an overall score. For example, in the global pluralism index, if a country is very good in policies for one kind of uh, diversity, but it's not good for another kind of diversity. How does it uh, play together? And I think it's very ambitious to ensure comparability over the world. I think it makes more than more sense sometimes to group countries, to really look at countries with similar groups, similar histories, and then to uh, compare them and then give them the opportunity to, to learn with each other. Because for example, the problem of indigenous populations is not really um, an issue in Germany. 
it's an issue in, in, in South American countries and so on. So it's quite different uh, uh, groups that are vulnerable. They are have to, to um, be uh, focused on. And I think that's important to, 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 to make country samples to, to uh, compare them. Although I know that it's uh, much too, too early to do that because it's a an, an pilot and for that it, you have to start with some very small samples. Overall, I think um, indicators are very useful for communication and comparison. However, I think if the subject is very complex and the scoring is rather subject of discussion, it sometimes I think it's better to communicate with stories than with scores. Because at the moment I have scores and numbers, people will compare these scores and numbers. So they, even if we say it's not really comparable with each other, they will do it. For that, I think sometimes stories or back practices are a very good uh, way to communicate and to avoid a kind of superficial comparison. comparison. For, the, um, for the number of indicators, I think there has a lot of indicators collected, especially in the Greece indicators uh, work, but there might be a an, 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 uh, task worse to really look what are the driving indicators? How can the indicators reduce that uh, we want to collect? Because collecting data and collecting um, uh, data that are really reliable is very time and cost intensive. And for that, I think it's very important to, to, to try to really reduce the number of indicators on very important ones if you can find it out with statistical methods, with, um, with analysis, and then to, to focus on them and to use the time and the money to collect them. My second issue I wanted to comment on is the kind of indicators. There is at both indices, there is a mix of different indicators, qualitative, quantitative, in policy input, policy output, and at the final end, really outcome, policy outcome, what, what happens in the society indicators. For example, of the GIS indicator, there is this composite index one and two and four that clearly measures governance, input indicators, policy output indicators, while the radicalization levels is a kind of output, uh, outcome of, of these policies. And therefore it would interesting to look at correlations between the uh, different uh, composite indicators. To how do they relate to each other? If you find out that there are some indicators that really can explain the outcomes, then I think you can ra raise very much of attention of your project because then you can really make uh, advice at what are important policies issues that really leads to, to different outcomes in society. That's the whole issue in the policy, uh, in the plural um, index. There are also governance indicators, legal commitment indicators, practices, but there are also these outcome indicators as um, intergroup relations and belonging. And there is a question that there could be uh, that there could, we could find out whether certain policy inputs can really uh, have impact in the outputs, or they are really responsible, or make changes in in intergroup relations and belonging within countries. But for that, you really need a, a, a higher number of countries that you can do this testing. There, are, there, there could be a lot of discussions, but I would like to stop here with this few um, methodological comments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andrea. Yeah, you didn't make it any easier <laughs> with these few comments and questions, but very, very interesting. Uh, thank you, Giacomo. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so first of all, I would, I would like to start with really thanking uh, the presenters for the wonderful presentation and also the effort in creating such great indexes and interesting projects. 
uh, I really appreciate, for example, the conceptual and methodological rigor behind the development of these tools. And it was clearly explained in, uh, in the presentation. Uh, so in, this, in my brief comment, I, I'm going to, to talk about three main points and to comment on three main points. The first one is the conceptualization and definition behind these indexes. I will then move to the contribution in the frame of the debate on migrant integration. So I will really frame the contribution in, in the migrant integration field. And I will talk about the methodology and the aggregation as also Andrea uh, said and talked about. Um, so first of all, I must say that uh, the two projects uh, did quite a good job in terms of uh, defining uh, and putting also some boundaries to these two concepts that are sometimes in literature, as it has been said, also quite vague. Uh, but they really did break, broke down uh, all the different dimension. And that, for example, for the Global Pluralism Index, I really appreciate this difference and this holistic approach uh, encompassing, let's say, the institution side and the cultural, as they say, mindset uh, side. Uh, while for degrees, I think it's really interesting the, uh, the link between the governance of religious diversity and also the topic of radicalization. Of course, this uh, implies also some challenges uh, on which I will come back uh, after on the methodological part. Uh, but of, of course, when you listen to a new project, you al always think in terms of what is new, what is the contribution uh, to the field. Uh, for example, uh, in the frame also of, of MyPEX and also this European project that it just finished called Cross Migration, we did a review of indexes on migration policies, and we found 67 indexes on the topic. Uh, out of that, 30 were on migrant integration. So it's really a, a key question when it comes to migrant integration. But I must say that I'm very impressed because I think that the two in, these two indexes provide really contribution on migrant integration. Uh, so in literature, you have like normally three areas uh, that concern migrant integration. The first one is the legal and political area, so uh, citizenship opposition, for example, anti-discrimination law, and so on. You have also social economic dimension, which is, for example, labor market, access to labor market, and then you have the, uh, cultural religious dimension, cultural religious dimension. Uh, both indexes, I think, focus on this third dimension, which is sometimes overlooked by indexes on migrant integration, like uh, MyPEX, for example, focuses on the first two dimensions, but not on the cultural religious dimension. So I think that their contribution is to complement the already existing research uh, on the topic and the already existing indexes on the topic. And it would be interesting also to, to match the results, for example, on Canada of these three indexes to see if, if really there is a, a, a overall trend in the, in the integration integration uh, policies. Um, I also think that the contribution is also to focus broadly on the category of diversity or uh, say, and not only on migrants and immigrants or as we say in Europe, third country national, uh, but it's really broadened the scope of integration, the focus on of integration process. Uh, for example, to the so-called second generation or in general, what we can say, uh, we could call ethnic uh, uh, minority. Uh, it's also, it also presents these two topics or in general the topic of integration as something that concerns the entire society. So it's not really something that it's only uh, concerning migrants itself or newcomers, but it's really, some, there are really say, issues or challenges that concern uh, the entire society. So these three contributions, so providing uh, added value on this third cultural uh, and religious dimension and broadening the scope uh, to the whole society, I must say, is really a contribution that I really appreciate uh, on the book. Um, on the methodology, so moving to the methodology, uh, I really appreciate that they use a solid methodology, like they use a peer reviewers uh, of checks. Uh, they use also uh, the international standards, so there is a clear reference framework, which of course is good also in terms of comparability and also in terms of extending to additional countries, for example, in the future. And also the coding system, the answer options are overall, let's say, uh, quite clear, simple, and consistent. 
And again, this will allow in the future uh, to widen the scope, the geographical scope uh, of, the, uh, of the indexes, also to do some comparison between the different dimensions within the same index, for example. Uh, I want also to stress that, uh, at least from the presentation and from the documents that I read, both indexes or the research behind these indexes really stress the transparency of the research process. Uh, so I would like to stress the importance also to share the, the data, uh, the, uh, all the methodological issues and challenges faced uh, to make the field, say, grow uh, and to cooperate with other uh, scholars on the same topics or similar topics, or also to allow other, other scholars to work and to compare their indexes, like for example, for us would be MIPEX, with their indexes. Uh, I must say, uh, beside this, that I agree with Andrea on some issues uh, resting with saying the fact of mixing different kinds of uh, indicators, especially uh, indicators that address the policy outputs, so laws and policies, and also outcomes, which ultimately refer to the effect of this policies. Uh, so if we aggregate, let's say, the data to get all, the, all these indicators together, which has not been done in the presentation, but a user always tend to do that, or it's not clearly stated the difference between these two area uh, of analysis or level of analysis, I think it, uh, the indexes would be affected or there would be a, a lack of clarity in the results because it's really mixing two different uh, uh, areas, let's say, that are linked together and actually that one might explain the other one. So for example, the policy output might, might explain the outcomes, but, but that's also not necessarily the case. Uh, so the situation we know that, especially with migrant integration, it's always much more complex. So there are a, a set of different uh, uh, factors influencing the integration of migrants. Out of that policy outputs of laws, and policies on integration are one of, uh, of the main, let's say. This ultimately also linked to the conceptualization of these indexes, which is quite clear, but I think authors should do also a little bit more on understanding what is really, what they want really to measure and what they want to say on the country through the indexes. So for example, I would suggest them to, uh, to split the indexes into different parts. It can be on outputs and outcomes and to really state uh, what the index uh, refers to. Uh, again, to improve the clarity of the results. Uh, for example, also uh, sometimes uh, in the presentation, I saw that uh, researchers were speaking or were talking about the implementation side, the practical side of the policy outputs. Uh, I think it, it was in degrees uh, yes, in which you have a legal dimension and a practical dimension. Again, if, you, if we look at the indicators used in the practical dimension, from my perspective, this refers to outcomes. So the effect of the, of the legal dimension or the possible effect of the legal dimension. So again, I, I want to stress the importance of making this clear also in the analysis. And as Andrea said, uh, for example, you can run some correlation to see the, how they correlate. And then this would be interesting, or you can do it more narratively, uh, really to understand what is going on and the effect of the legal dimension on the outcomes, uh, in this case, on, on the implementation practical dimension. Uh, I want to then conclude with uh, some specific comments on the Global Pluralism Index. Uh, I must say that, uh, in general, the, uh, the questions are quite well structured, but sometimes I found that there is a high degree of subjectivity. Uh, like, for example, there is a risk in, a, in, a, in the question on efforts and practice uh, that countries or country experts with higher expectation will be more severe on, on, on the country. Uh, this is also linked sometimes to the wording, uh, like uh, you talk about strong laws, very high level of trust. Uh, but I would define more clearly, say, the, what higher strong standards uh, refer to with maybe concrete example and or other details. And this again uh, will be very useful uh, when you widen the scope for, uh, um, 
of, of the analysis to further country and to make it sure, make it clear also that this comparison is meaningful and, and, and be sure that the, the comparison is, is possible. But all in all, to conclude, I must say that I was very impressed by the quality, the high quality of the work. And I think that both projects are on the right uh, pathway to become very leading, let's say, indexes on, on this uh, uh, subcategory of, of migrant integration that refer to culture and, and culture and religion. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Giacomo, too. Very, very, very interesting and important questions. Uh, maybe I can take this this opportunity because we, as always, we've taken a little bit more time uh, to to ask uh, to add to the to the questions of our discussants. Uh, just two, two questions uh, from from the chat room, and then I'll give uh, the floor back to Kundan and to Ross and Lily to address them briefly. And please keep in mind we would like to have a few more questions from the participants. So um, one question that has come up is. Um, are the two indicators addressing also non-religious groups and by non-religious meaning uh, groups like atheists um, and also if religiously motivated violence inc includes forced conversion and uh, I think these are more addressed to Greece but also to, to the global pluralism index and one particular for global pluralism index um, why use the notion of belonging to society as part of uh, measuring pluralism uh, and how does this account for the very different situations of different countries? Of what does it mean to, uh, you know, like this love Germany, feel German, uh, etc. So Kunda, and please feel free to be selective, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in the order of addressing the questions or in addressing some of them. Absolutely. Thank you, Anna. Uh, I'll go to the participant questions first. Um, as for are including non-religious groups in the larger set of diversity groups. Uh, we, we don't put boundaries uh, in terms of religion, like we have, uh, we focus, or some assessments focus on religious groups, ethnic groups, indigenous groups. So the point I'm trying to make is assessors have enough bandwidth to identify which diversity groups are relevant to a particular assessment. So in, if in some countries, migrants as a group are not really very relevant, then assessors can choose to look at another group which is more relevant than migrant groups or is uh, more relevant to that particular context. And in that sense, we don't uh, completely put aside or completely focus on religious groups. Uh, the second question was why do we, uh, why do we maintain a distance between national identity and belonging to a society? Well, that is, uh, that is largely based on the migrant experience as well. A lot of immigrants, a lot of second generation uh, immigrants, they may feel belonging in a particular society, but not really in the nationalist sense. And uh, there are strong fault lines developing along singular national identity and debates and who really belongs in a country and who doesn't. Uh, and we really wanted to capture that. As for the question on I feel German and uh, whether I love Germany, that is from another study. That is not the uh, primary data that we collected. Um, uh, the, our perception survey, which we could not unfortunately conduct in Germany uh, during the pilot, we conducted it in uh, Canada along with CDEM and uh, in Kenya, uh, in Kenya and Ghana along with the uh, Afrobarometer. Those had a different measure of belonging, and uh, we, at least, we are trying to be very deliberate in maintaining a, uh, a distance from national uh, identity singular national identity. Thank you, Kundan, uh, Lili, and Rosita. Uh, okay, thank you for the questions. Uh, I would prefer to address first uh, questions from the discussants. Um, thank you very much for your comments, uh, Andrea and Giacomo. Uh, these were, uh, especially the comments on, on the methodology, these are things we have been considering throughout the process of uh, creating the indicators. So we are not surprised by your comments. Um, regarding one of Andrea's comments, 
uh, about the need for detailed catalog for each country. Um, yeah, we were going back and forth about this. And indeed, if you look at um, the whole spreadsheet with the indicators, we not only provide scalings for each sub indicator, but we provide boxes for comments. And if you also look at the um, uh, actual assessments, we created them in a narrative format so that there could be context included uh, as an explanation for the scores. Uh, so yeah, we, we do understand that this is important and we try to incorporate it as much as possible. Um, regarding ensuring compa uh, com comparability, that's a very big ambition. Uh, we agree with, with this. Uh, and one of your suggestions was to include um, comparisons within groups of countries. If you look at the Greece project, uh, indeed, this is how we were, uh, how the project is conceptualized and it looks at countries within different regions. And actually some of the suggestions from our partners when we would be discussing the indicators was to do regional, com uh, inter-regional comparisons, so comparisons within countries. And as you can see in some of uh, the slides on our presentation, we tried to group the countries um, in regions. And we actually, in the results, if you look deeper at them, uh, we see trends that actually some regions, um, the countries within them, according to some indicators, they seem to be scoring very similarly and is the same for countries within other regions. So I think our indicators, if we look more deeply in the analysis, it's possible for us to do some um, regional com uh, comparisons in terms of countries within certain regions. Um, regarding the comments about the numbers of indicators and that there are too many. Yes, we understand this. Uh, initially, they were even more. <laughs> So it was a big challenge for us in the process to, to condense them and we did the best that we could to um, choose indicators on which there was consensus in the consortium uh, as the most important indicators. Uh, I know for composite indicator three, uh, it seems like there are many, many, but the processes that we are trying to capture are very complex and there are so many factors, uh, particularly in the case of of a radicalization that need to be considered as part of the equation. And then the last comment I want to address from the discussions about the kinds of indicators. Um, and I think this was particularly referring to indicators one and two on the Greece project, about the legal and the practical dimension. Um, maybe we need to clarify in the analysis more what the purpose of each of these dimensions was. Um, the goal of having a legal and a practical dimension is not to um, make statements about outcome. You know, to, in a sense, we are not trying to say, okay, this is what the legal situation is, and therefore uh, there is an outcome coming out of the state of uh, legal affairs. No, no, no. We are trying to compare how things are prescribed in, according to the legislation. And then also we are seeing how things are in practice, but we are not trying to make statements whether the way things uh, are in practice is the result of legislation. Uh, so regarding the questions from uh, the chat, I'll address one and I'll let Rossi address another one uh, regarding uh, whether our indicators are addressing non-religious groups. Um, indeed, the Greece project is looking primarily, uh, one of the topics is religion and the management of religious groups and how, how religious minorities are governed. So our focus was mostly on religious groups. We are not taking into account, account non-religious groups. Um, yeah, and I guess that's what I can say on this question. And then Rossi, maybe you can give an yeah. answer. Yeah. yeah, just very briefly, there was a question, do you consider forced religious conversion in religiously motivated violence? Yes, this would align with the definition we use, basically violence used by in-group against an out-group to achieve religious goals or to suppress or el eliminate this out-group. So yeah, that by definition, yes. It, it gets a bit lost in the data because the, the data we have on, on the violence, um, violent, violence part comes mostly from the social hostilities index and this is only one dimension of this index because it does 
measure or capture incidents related to using of force by groups to dominate public life, violent enforcement of different religious practices. So yes, so, and the reason we took this index is because again, we had to capture many different world regions. So if you take only South Asia, uh, it might be, Kind of easier to do this type of analysis but different context so we had to take such a measure that's where details get lost for sure but yeah it is included yes thank you thank you very much um actually i see we're almost running out of time i see another question about uh, whether the the global center for pluralism can give some more details on the public perception data and how they were collected and maybe I think this relates to, to a question that has been addressed to the, uh, in the Greece project. How much one can use existing surveys and existing, um, uh, you know, kind of um, aggregate data per country um, to build, um, you know, indicators that would go beyond uh, the specific world region or the specific cluster of countries, which is, I think, something also raised by Andrea. Um, so, Kundan? Sure thing. Thank you so much. And I was wondering if I could address some other concerns raised by discussions as well, if I have time. Uh, but first, about the perception survey. So the idea is to collect data uh, from a nationally representative sample. So generally, that number uh, moves between 1,500 to about 3,000 respondents in a country, depending on the population. Uh, at this point, we uh, we really want to uh, want to include group representative samples, uh, but we'll see how the cost implications of oversampling a particular group of interest uh, in a country and how that works out. Uh, we generally look for implementation partners, like in Canada, I said, we worked with CDEM, uh, in, uh, in Ghana and Kenya, we try to work, uh, we are still working with uh, Afrobarometer. So we try to insert questions with existing efforts so that uh, it is an efficient and quick way of collecting data. As for the data itself, it, it includes measures of belonging, measures of intergroup trust, and uh, some measures of uh, shared ownership of the society that looks at uh, both personal space, professional space, and society uh, in general. That is how, uh, that is a brief overview of uh, the kind of public perception data that we, co that we collect. Uh, and as for the concerns around subjectivity of assessors, uh, uh, we really try to include, uh, or we really try to identify assess as assessors, people who are scholars or practitioners in, the, in a very established capacity. They go through extensive vetting uh, and before they start the assessment. And there's an international technical advisory group. Uh, you can read more about them on the Global Pluralism Index page to make sure that the methodology and data sources and the opinions sort of coincide with what is being presented in the report. Uh, yes, there uh, there are concerns around subjectivity, but we really uh, believe that our assessors are a good judge of, of what is relevant and what is not. And uh, there are concerns of subjectivity with objective data as well. So uh, we, uh, at this scale to synthesize a report in a really objective way where we collect uh, we, where we collect primary data for each and every indicator is uh, is very very onerous task. Um, finally, indices by their nature are reductive, are very deductive. So uh, they all they can only provide a snapshot. In terms of policy engagement, we we rely on focused stakeholder engagement within each country to arrive at concrete policy solutions that we can look at. An, an index, especially an index like uh, Global Pluralism Index, can uh, can indicate gap trends and you know time-related trends in the country. But to arrive at concrete policy solutions, it needs engagement with local stakeholders, and we are very aware of that. And uh, we are putting a lot of effort towards using Global pluralism index as a stepping stone towards those engagement and not presenting everything which is beyond, you know, which uh, 
which throws all the analysis in, in the global pluralism index of the journal. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kundan. This is very helpful to also appreciate the challenges um, in conducting this exercise. Uh, Lily and Rosita, a final comment on this? Yeah, very briefly on the on the use of uh, uh, kind of poll uh, survey data. We didn't have the luxury to collect primary data. I would much have preferred that, of course. Uh, so we, of course, use uh, available uh, data from Eurobarometer, Eurobarometer, Balkan Barometer, and the Pew Research uh, Global Attitude Surveys. But even that is difficult. So we always try to be very rigorous to look at, you know, when we take uh, certain uh, data to to make sure that the question was asked in in a similar way that the service of course are representative and so on and conducted within already established such instruments but even that is problematic uh, because the countries we covered are so diverse uh, and as you know in some of these countries conducting open polling data is problematic because uh, people might feel very reluctant to comment on their government on issues such as religion and politics so yeah that's uh, um, that's something we had to we had to accept um, and of course that's why we put so much um, uh, importance also on, on commenting all these results in context putting them in context thank you very much um, thank you all for the very rich insights both uh, you know substantial empirical but also methodological i think we have earned a break right now just to stretch our legs so it's now 12.30 uh, in Toronto. Uh, I know, I mean, I actually I'm very pleased to see in the, the gallery many names and faces from uh, different world regions. So, and I, and I know for some it is a little late. So the idea is we break for five minutes and we come back at, uh, in, in five minutes at 12.35 or 35 past the, the hour to continue with our second session. Stay tuned because we're gonna talk about Canada, but also look at how these different indicators probably give divergence scores on, on the same country, so the same laws, policies, and practices. So see you in five minutes.
Uh, hi again, everyone. Uh, actually, while it is a short uh, uh, workshop, in if you are in person, to have one and a half plus one hour. When it is online, I think we're all challenged by sticking on our screens. And I do appreciate for, that for some of our um, attendees, it's probably 7.30 or 6.30 uh, in the late afternoon or early evening. Um, and I also appreciate that when we started for our participants from uh, Western Canada, it was like 8 a.m. So, but uh, we're making the most of uh, the digital technology and I, I, I fully appreciate that. Anyhow, for me, the, the easy part of this workshop uh, starts for me now because I'll, I'll give the floor and the, uh, how can I say, control uh, to Keith Banting. I'm, I'm very pleased to have a distinguished panel for this uh, second part of our conversation. And we thought it was much better to have a true um, expert on Canada like, like Keith uh, chair this discussion. I'm a totally new uh, expert, a new Canadian. Um, so I look forward to our discussion. Keith, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Anna. And thank you for asking me to uh, chair this session. <clears throat> I think it's going to be very interesting. So the, in the first uh, panel, we had um, <clears throat> full exposition of a, a number of important new uh, indices <clears throat> and a methodological discussion of their strengths, weaknesses, and challenges. In this session, we switch a little more tightly the focus to one Canada, one country, Canada, and we ask what you learn from different uh, indices about this country. And I suspect we'll also have a discussion a, a bit about sort of like the uses of these um, uh, indices, both in academic life, but also in public life, public debates, and particularly government decision making. For this discussion, we have three wonderful speakers. Uh, I will introduce them very briefly um, with just their titles. I suspect most of them are known to you. Um, the first is Will Kimlicka, who is a uh, faculty member in the Department of Philosophy at Queen's University and has devoted much of his, if not all of his, no, much of his career, take that back, uh, to the study of multiculturalism and diversity and uh, public policies responding to it. And I suspect is well known to all of you. Our second speaker is Thomas Huddleston, who is research director at the Migration Policy Group and is the coordinator of one of the longstanding indices in the field, the MIPEX. Uh, the first time I met Tom, Thomas, we were on a panel on, believe it or not, comparing different indices. It, it happened in Barcelona, uh, and there are some advantages to face-to-face. -to -face. But um, so we've been uh, uh, sort of interacting in the field for some time. So Thomas brings a, a lot of experience in this field to the conversation. Our third speaker, Enrico del Castellano, sorry, Castello, um, is director in the uh, <clears throat> Immigration, Refugee and Citizenship Department in the Government of Canada and has had a very lengthy and interesting career in both the civil society sector having to deal with immigration and integration questions and in the Government of Canada where he has worked in a number of departments, but usually related in some way to the diverse, uh, diversity index, or sorry, the diversity issues. And so I welcome all three of these speakers. They've each been given eight minutes, which, you know, I, <clears throat> as you can probably tell already, I can barely clear my throat in eight minutes. So it will be a challenge to them, uh, but I'll ask them to keep to that. So we have time for a conversation among the speakers immediately afterwards and then time for questions from the audience. So we start with Will Kimlicka. Will, over to you. Thanks, thanks Keith. So uh, as many of you know, I, I think we have a problem in Canada when it comes to thinking about uh, public policies in a comparative perspective, which is that most of the time we just really compare ourselves with one country, namely the United States. 
And so if we're interested in an issue like, I don't know, child poverty or health care or gun violence, we ask ourselves, are we better than the United States? And if we are, we're doing okay. Um, and I think that's a real problem actually with the Canadian public debate that we, we focus too much on the US comparison. And so I think it's a really good to have comparative indexes that force us to compare ourselves with other countries, particularly in, in Europe. Uh, and those on many public policy issues, I think these comparative indicators show that other countries are doing much better than us. Uh, in many cases, much, much better than us on many public policy fields. And I think that's a very useful uh, reminder and wake up call for Canadians. But on this issue for today's discussion about the managing of ethnic and uh, religious diversity, my sense is that most of these comparative indicators in this field tend to actually confirm Canadians' belief that we are doing as well or better than most other countries. I think most of these different indicators are going to end up showing that Canada is a leader rather than a laggard on the managing of uh, ethnic and uh, religious diversity. Um, and I think that's shown in, in the, the, what we've already seen in the presentations earlier. Um, and I think it's uh, worth remembering one reason why Canada may be a, a leader in this field, that many countries in Europe don't necessarily want to be seen as a leader uh, in this field. So in many of these countries, you think about uh, Denmark or the Netherlands, uh, other countries, political parties are criticizing each other for being too soft on immigrants or for making too many concessions to Muslims. And so in that political context, it's actually it would be a problem for the country to be seen as a leader in the accommodation of minorities. Uh, and for many of those countries, they actually want to be kind of safely in the middle of the pack. I think there aren't that many countries like Canada that actually want to be a kind of champion of, of diversity. So I, I suspect for the foreseeable future, whatever the details of individual indicators, that on the composite scores, at least, Canada is going to turn out to do relatively well. We still might think that when we dig down into the details and disaggregate the composite numbers, we can find more specific uh, discrete policies on which other countries are doing better and from which we can learn. And so I just want to pick two examples, one from the MIPEX and one from the Greece uh, study uh, because I think they're interesting and interestingly complicated uh, to make these comparisons. So if you look at the MIPEX report on Canada, Canada does pretty well on many indicators of immigrant integration, but we score quite badly below average on enabling political participation of immigrant groups. Uh, that has always puzzled Canadians. This is a long-standing issue uh, because we've all been told by our social scientists that immigrants to Canada, whether it's after five years or 10 years or 20 years, that they are actually more likely, immigrants in Canada are more likely than immigrants in other countries, in any other country, to vote in national elections, to, be, to run for political office, to be elected to political office. So we've been told that immigrants have unusually high levels of political participation and representation compared to other countries. But according to MIPEX, we're, we're uh, below average on enabling political participation. We fall below countries like Denmark or Switzerland in enabling political participation of immigrants, which is puzzling for many of us because Denmark and Switzerland have quite exclusionary citizenship policies. It's very hard for immigrants to gain full voting rights by becoming citizens. But as a consolation prize, in, in uh, Denmark and Switzerland, Immigrants are allowed to vote in local elections even when they're not citizens. So non-citizen immigrants have the local voting rights in Denmark and Switzerland. And according to MIPEX, that's more important for evaluating enabling of political participation than how easy it is to become a citizen with full voting rights. So I'm one of those, this is a long-standing argument, I'm one of those who thinks that's just a mistake. I think that's a moral and a political mistake about how we evaluate what contributes to effective political participation. In my view, local voting rights for non-citizens is neither necessary nor sufficient to ensure effective political participation of immigrants. 
it's clearly not sufficient for effective political participation because immigrants can have local voting rights as they do in Denmark and Switzerland and be subject to kind of massive structural exclusion from the larger political process and indeed to be basically the scapegoats of that larger political process. But I also think it's not necessary if there's relatively easy access to citizenship and hence full and equal voting rights. If you've got, if you can get the real prize, first class equal citizenship rights, it's not really essential that you have as a, as a consolation prize local voting rights when you're a non-citizen. So I'm not sure actually, I, I actually just don't believe that Denmark and Switzerland do a better job than Canada of enabling immigrant political participation. So let me take another example from the Greece uh, indicators. So according to the, to the Greece metrics, Canada does pretty well, you saw the graph on the protection of religious minority rights. Uh, actually, I think it scored highest of all the countries in the, in the sample. But according to the Greece project, Canada scores only middling on a couple of indicators around secularism. And secularism is understood in the Greece project as the state doesn't interfere with religious groups and inter religious groups don't interfere with the state. So my sense is that Canada actually does reasonably well uh, uh, on secularism understood that way. But according to Greece, Canada scores only middling because our constitution does not have a clear and explicit articulation of secularism. We don't have a kind of slogan about secularism in the constitution and there's no kind of explicit statement about a wall of separation between the state and church. So, and so we score less well than other countries like Spain or Slovakia on, on secularism. So I, again, I find this a bit puzzling. I, I, so I, it's not clear to me that this kind of constitutional statement of secularism is really necessary um, or even beneficial. So I actually think these kind of slogans about the separation of state and church are actually just not very helpful. In the world we live in, state and religious organizations are constantly interacting. So whenever you have religious bodies engaged in providing education, providing healthcare, running senior citizens' office, homes, or authorized to conduct marriages, we're inevitably gonna have the state regulating how religious bodies operate. We need to set the rules about what counts as a valid marriage and how old you can be to get married. There have to be rules about how religious hospitals meet criteria of equal access and so on. So that's an ongoing process that I think is just not helped by slogans about non-intervention between the state and religion. The question is, what's the grounds on what are the principles and values on which the state and religious organizations interact? And my sense for what it's worth is that in Canada, we actually have pretty good guidelines for that interaction between state and religious organizations. And, and indeed the Supreme Court jurisprudence on this issue is actually quite in influential internationally. It's seen as a, I think it's quite uh, as a model about how to think through the relations between state and church. So I don't see this kind of explicit constitutional statement of secularism as necessary. And in fact, I think it's dangerous. So if you think about it at the moment here in Canada, who is in favor of uh, entrenching a constitutional commitment to secularism? Like this is a real live issue in Canada. Who's in favor of that? It's the populists. So this is what's going on in Quebec. They, they passed a charter of secular values. Why? So that the very next day, they could then prohibit Muslim women in the civil service from wearing the kneecap. That is the politics of secularism in Canada today, but it's not just in Canada. Secularism has been weaponized to undermine the rights of religious minorities. So from the point of Greece, there's this kind of paradox. We're strong on religious minority rights, but we're weak on secularism because we don't have this formal constitutional commitment. I actually think the two go together. We have been able to develop this kind of robust set of religious minority rights because we don't have this kind of dogmatic and potentially weaponized interpret uh, listing of secularism in the constitution. Okay, so those are just two examples from, from my backs and from Greece where Canada is scored lower than other countries, but which as I read the cases, I am actually not persuaded that Canada is doing worse than other countries on those, on those indicators. I think that raises a more general question. I, and I raise this for the audience as well. 
what, what countries do we think are doing better? On which indicators do we think other countries are doing better? I think it's an interesting question. I, and I didn't really get a clear sense from either the GCP report or, the, or MIPEX or uh, Greece. That, which is not to say that things are going well in Canada. On the contrary, we've got lots of problems and that's why we're all signed up for this kind of a workshop. We know there are lots of problems. But my sense is that we need to disconnect the question of how we identify the problems we face and the remedies to them from the question of whether other countries are doing better than us. I actually just, I don't think it's really helpful for us to figure out what's going wrong in Canada. I don't think the best way to approach that question is by finding out, asking who's doing better on these indicators, because I think for the foreseeable future, as I said, most countries are not even interested in doing as well as we are. Thanks, I'll stop there. Okay, thanks, Will. Uh, a, a, a vigorous uh, presentation as always. We now turn to Thomas. Thomas, the floor is yours. Great, thank you um, so much. And uh, I will certainly uh, persuade uh, you, Will, um, on my pecs. Now, what I wanted to, I'm gonna share my screen because I'm gonna orient um, you all to some uh, different uh, results. So the question here is, what do we really learn about governance on diversity from using these types of indexes? Um, what could we learn in the future? So I am going to give some examples uh, from MIPEX. So what I find useful is that once uh, we actually talk about what we want to measure and think about how we compare policies uh, across different countries, then actually we get um, a new look at ourselves, perhaps one that surprises us, just like Will Kimlicka was saying, surprised to see when you look at the results for Canada, that one of Canada's weaknesses is political participation, which um, I should make clear is for foreign, political participation of foreign citizens. So indeed, the fact that the main way that you can become politically active in Canada is through citizenship, means that for those who don't become citizens, you don't have as many venues as you would have in other countries. But again, by having this, uh, then Will Kimlicka has a, a reflection on uh, political participation. One area that I would also recommend that Canadians reflect on is another area of weakness identified from MIPEX, which is uh, health policy. And again, comparing yourself to America, you might think that there are really, um, Canada is a great system for um, being inclusive and responsive to migrant health needs, uh, but actually, when we look at broader international standards, there are other countries that can learn from. So again, as uh, Will was saying, it confronts you maybe with different expectations. Um, and you also then can look and, as you said, look at what other countries are doing better. So, for example, here I just drew up the results on political participation of foreign citizens. And I wouldn't necessarily say that Canada uh, should just look to Denmark, um, but actually the, generally the Nordic approach to democracy is what explains why these countries have a uh, more developed policy. Or you could look to Australia and New Zealand that in many ways maintained this more inclusive, inclusive Commonwealth approach to political participation that Canada and the United States uh, got rid of. So it, um, it also draws, as uh, Will was saying, draws your attention to countries that you might not have thought of. Here are the overall uh, MIPEX results. Uh, and again, as I agree with Will here that um, while maybe the Nordic countries, Portugal, um, New Zealand, and perhaps we're adding some new countries in this MIPEX this autumn, so you might see some surprising countries that arrive and go to the top. Maybe there are some specific countries that you can look to for particular policies, but I think that we also can look deeper, as uh, Will was saying, to try and get some maybe more realistic expectations of what we can do. So. One of the nice ways that um, creating these types of indexes has helped us to think more differently is that we also now have more regional and local indexes of uh, integration uh, and diversity policies from the intercultural cities uh, index in Europe uh, to here the index of the new American economies um, in the United States that actually gives us a better idea if you're a local or regional authority about uh, what you can uh, be doing. I think that using these uh, indexes uh, also allow us to have uh, debate um, to try and understand where our policies are going. And uh, I remember the last time that we launched uh, 
my text, it got on the main uh, page of many news items in Canada because Canada had actually gone down on my text. And it was a chance to discuss why the government's restrictions on family unification and on citizenship um, were put in place and what could be their potential impacts on integration outcomes. So having these indexes certainly allow us to better have discussions um, in our own countries, but also uh, at the global level. So I don't know if any of you were aware, but in the original drafts of the Global Compact on Migration, states were actually called to participate in the MIPEX because it was a way to identify challenges and best practices. And we really do hope that our initiative can lead to something more global so that we can get a bigger picture and find uh, you know, more countries where we can have inspiration from. Um, but perhaps for this audience, which is more researchers, what I would really like you to know is that, I mean, we've identified about 130 multivariate or multi-level analyses, mostly with data from Europe, but that looks at how integration policies relate to outcomes. Um, and that give us a better idea of the effectiveness uh, of our policies. So I don't want to give all this away because this is what we're going to be launching um, this autumn. But um, countries that have more inclusive integration policies and also political participation and citizenship policies uh, do end up high in having higher levels of political participation in various areas. One study finds that it's about a 30 to 40 percent increased likelihood of participating in electoral and non-electoral participation. Um, higher levels of a naturalization, uh, higher levels of belonging uh, by immigrants, uh, and also more positive attitudes by the public and more reciprocal attitudes. So immigrants and the public tend to think very similarly about each other. Um, so it gives us, uh, as I said, a better understanding of what can be some realistic, um, what can be realistic expectations for our policies? How could we implement our policies better? What can our policies do? in this area. I want to give you one quick example, which is something I've been hearing a lot of recently, which is why do we have strong anti-discrimination um, policies when actually we see that people think discrimination is a problem in these countries? So a country has high, high levels of people saying discrimination is a problem, uh, but they have strong laws. So actually these laws have failed. Whereas actually by looking at this type of multivariate uh, analysis, this is work done by Conrad Ziller, he has found that when you have strong anti-discrimination laws over time, you get greater public awareness of discrimination and awareness uh, of the laws. So you actually see here, uh, and this would relates to the finding from the uh, Greece project, that um, in countries with very weak anti-discrimination laws like Latvia and Estonia, people generally don't know the, their rights if they are victims, and they also don't think that discrimination happens. Whereas in a country like Sweden or the UK, um, actually you have strong laws, so it actually has informed uh, people, um, and they realize that discrimination uh, is a problem. And as we get better data on implementation, we actually are able to then see if these laws are effective. And here, for example, from the EU's um, survey of uh, immigrants, we see that people who say they're a victim of discrimination are more likely to report that uh, in countries that have stronger anti-discrimination laws. So again, I think for the researchers, it's quite interesting now to do multivariate, multi-level analyses if you're a quantitative scholar. Um, we need to have more harmonized data so that we can include Canada because most of this data is based on uh, the laboratory of diversity that is uh, the European Union. Um, and we can get, as I say, more realistic expectations for what our policies can achieve. But I just wanted to end briefly, I know I'm a little bit over time. Um, I don't know if you can still see my screen, but um, I feel like we need to have broader discussions because as, uh, <laughs> as Will was saying, yes, I mean, on issues of uh, integration, um, and diversity, probably uh, everyone who agrees with us is, is just talking with us, and many people who don't agree with us uh, are not interested in this discussion. But there is a broader discussion that the Global Pluralism Index was trying to highlight, which is that um, actually many of the tenets of multiculturalism 
are things that people want to live with. I mean, people want to live in peaceful and equitable societies, uh, particularly uh, if they're living in a diverse society. And a lot of our work, like the work from MIPEX, really only focuses on the aspects related to immigration related diversity. So how uh, do our policies governing immigrants perhaps also affect our own attitudes towards immigrants and the way we interact uh, with immigrants? Um, and a lot of the uh, indicators that we had from uh, MIPEX come from the aspect of multiculturalism related to immigrants. But what I find very enriching is that multiculturalism was a concept that applied to um, all traditionally marginalized groups in society. And we're looking to see how are we going to change the power dynamics in society so that all people um, can live in peace uh, and equity. Um, and you know, looking back in multiculturalism, you see that uh, we started to have maybe some discussions about how we could measure uh, multiculturalism for indigenous groups, how we could measure multiculturalism for different regional and national minorities. So I hope that, I mean, the Global Pluralism Index, uh, Greece, or, or other indexes that we create can maybe stop just looking at immigrants and instead look more broadly from a democratic perspective of uh, how can we live in a society that is peaceful and equitable? Because uh, following the uh, American uh, presidential debates, which I'm gonna wake up uh, in just a few hours <laughs> to uh, follow, I can see that many Americans would like to be like Canada, but, um, they are only now starting to wake up to the diversity and multicultural nature of their country and are not sure um, how they need to be readjusting power dynamics and equity in their society. And so I hope that in the future we can contribute more to these discussions on democracy. Thank you. And finally, uh, our third speaker is Enrico uh, and I uh, pass the floor to him. Thank you very much, Keith, and uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, and thank you to all my colleagues here today. Um, you provided an enlightening discussion so far on this very important topic. I also want to thank Anna Trianda Filidou for having invited me. I'm pleased to have been invited, and I'm all happy to offer some uh, reflections. Uh, today, I plan to provide a succinct, respecting the time, overview of how we at Immigration use governance indicators, how we create indicators, what we measure, and yes, what we do not measure. Uh, my presentation will conclude by going a few years back, in fact, many years back, by offering the view of how linguistic and cultural diversity have positively shaped Canadian society and how the prevalence of multiculturalism has influenced how we govern. Diversity and pluralism are central to Canadian identity and the inclusion and the recognition of a, a respect for diversity have always been a government priority. As a department whose mandate is focused primarily on migration, passport and citizenship too, diversity and pluralism have become a major byproduct of our efforts which benefits Canada greatly. However, they are not targets or goals in themselves. Before I delve into indicators, I should note that there are various streams through which a foreign national can gain work or study and have other experience in Canada and eventually immigrate to Canada as a permanent resident. Many foreign nationals begin their journey as temporary residents, either as workers or international students. For those that want to live permanently here, there are several permanent resident streams offered by Canada, such as through the Federal Economic Program, the Regional Economic Program, and the Family Reunification Program. Canada is also a world leader, as we all know, in offering protection and welcoming refugees through the Refugee Resettlement Program and through the Asylum Program. Regardless of the stream a person comes through, IRCC, our department, applications and admission processes do not actively collect data on ethnicity, religion, or cultural background. Provenance or religious belief are really irrelevant from an invisibility and eligibility standpoint. For the economic immigration streams, what we want to know and prioritize is whether a person can contribute to the economy, how this person's education skill set, competencies, and language ability make them suitable to come here, integrate, 
find work, and eventually become a fiscal contributor. These are the factors we look at. Obviously, people immigrate to Canada for a variety of reasons. There are some exceptions, and not only the economic ones. There are exceptions also to economic indicators, of course. We have family class, immigration, because Canada believe in the importance of family reunification, uh, and the benefits that this brings economically and socially of having family close by. For refugees, we do not primarily assess them by, based on their ability to contribute to the economy, but rather whether they require protection and meet the definition of refugee status. To all immigrants, we offer settlement services to help them improve the knowledge and the skills needed to integrate into Canada. Again, there are no parameters on ethnicity, religion, or cultural background in order to receive a settlement service. So what do we measure? In terms of data collection as it pertains to pluralism, what we do actively try and measure is integration of newcomers using indicators, for example, that focus on official languages use, contribution to the labor market, community connections, making informed decisions about life in Canada and others. And one of the ways we do this is through the creation of performance indicators. When we create these indicators, we follow a very simple logic model, program theory, and this is an approach which helps us to articulate the expected result of an intervention or a program, which then also outlines the criteria for a strong, reliable integrator. For example, I am sharing one slide and you will get the idea from what I mean. When we are constructing a performance indicator, we ensure that six main criteria are met. Indicators must be valid, meaning they have a clear relationship to the expected result, clear, they are specific and easily understood, measurable, we have accurate data already collected and available, separate, one element at a time is measured, diverse, use qualitative and quantitative indicators to paint the full picture, repeatable and comparable, and that is consistent data, collection methodology, and comparable over time. As you can see in the visual, there are examples of strong versus weak indicators. Let's apply them to real life context. Example of design- Sorry to, sorry uh, to interrupt. Uh, there they are. Okay, sorry. I, your slides weren't visible to me until just now. I don't okay. know if other people are having, but now you're, you're good. Okay, thank you, Keith. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, so, as uh, you can see in the visual, these are examples of strong versus weak in indicators, and let's apply them in a real, a real life context. Example of desired outcome for the economic immigrants is that immigrants achieve economic independence and there is an economic benefit to Canada. Indicators for this outcome include contribution to labor force, growth, and average earnings compared to those to occupational averages. Example of desired outcomes for non-economic streams such as the family reunification program or refugee classes include outcomes such as the ability to make informed decisions about life in Canada and ensuring that they are connected to communities and institutions. We also measure out economic outcomes and on these categories. These are measured using census style surveys that ask direct questions pertaining to the outcomes. This is why the collection of good data and the use of sound methodologies is integral to the creation of strong, reliable indicators. And the, an indicator can only be as good as the data we feed. In some, religion and culture are not a factor when determining uh, an applicant admissibility and eligibility. They are not indicators for our department success. So you could say that success for our department is measured to integration outcomes and indicators. Some general presumptions of religion and culture could be made based on where immigrants are from, but this is not always straightforward and each population can still have exceptions. At the same time, and, and, and this is where we go a little bit back in the history, it is perhaps worth noting that Canada has wrestled with these issues for many years. Back in 1969, 
Book four of the report of the Royal Commission on Bilingualism and Biculturalism, although not mandated to study the idea of diversity and pluri-ethnicity, advanced recommendations to preserve the cultural and linguistic contribution of the other ethnic group, since they constituted a significant component of Canadian society. And the volume four was entitled Other Ethnic Group, providing so the logic that everybody has an ethnic background in Canada, except, of course, uh, indigenous populations. Book four of the commission was also significant because it was the precursor to the policy of multiculturalism. It confirmed the fact that social interactions, which were occurring on a reciprocal basis, were influencing, influencing Canadian society at large, but these were positive and welcome changes. Book four further argued that it was possible to expect that the multiracial and the multicultural demography of Canada would have significant impact on the English as well as on the French cultures. And I conclude, while, that, while new immigrants were adapting to uh, the new way of life, at the same time, Canadian of English or French extraction were also exposed to the new situation and new cultures and languages that were being introduced into Canada. And in this respect, it advanced the proposal for indicators. Among these were education and media as two important outside indicators, which shaped opinion, uh, public opinion, excuse me, and formed younger generation. In essence, the book of the BNB Commission, as it was called, indicated very early on that the respect and the active cultivation of different languages and cultures within one nation state can only end up serving the common good, greatly enriching society and providing an advanced model of socio-political arrangement. Even if this would seem to contrast with the fact of not measuring certain indicators, it is in fact complementary, since the Commission argued at that time the language and culture cannot and should not be treated as political entities, which is exactly what the Royal Commission uh, and biculturalism uh, most highly clearly try to avoid. The Royal Commission argued in favor of considering the essence of language and culture and by extension of diversity, which is to educate, cultivate, and to develop human beings socially and intellectually. In this respect, the Commission paved the way for a better understanding of diversity, fo focusing very early on, as I noted, on the fact that the result of respecting and practicing diversity ends up in being good governance and education and media, while not necessarily being indicators in the strict sense of the world, they can both certainly contribute substantially to a better understanding of diversity, and in so doing, most certainly support good governance. And this is perfectly in line with what I think we have discussed today. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Enrico. Uh, um, so, we've had three presentations. We have a number of questions uh, from the um, from the audience. Before I turn to those, let me ask um, one question across the three groups, uh, three speakers, um, which has to do with the relevance of um, this kind of indicator. Um, and so let me put it this way. <clears throat> we live in a fairly populist era in which there is a, a higher level of challenge to the role of expertise, to the role of um, sort of uh, scientific or social science in shaping public policy, that the role of evidence-based public policy seems to be under challenge in many countries and that we live in a period in which um, other sorts of political drivers seem to shape outcomes. And so um, I want to ask all three of our speakers to briefly address the question, are we wasting our time? Who wants to start? Not all at once now. Shall we go in, in order? Why don't we go in the order that uh, people spoke in? So, Will? Yeah, no, it's a really good question. I was just reading recently, someone had done a study, and it was based kind of uh, detailed uh, interviews with policymakers in Europe, 
trying to understand why they had adopted various kinds of civic integration policies. And um, the, the conclusion of it was that policymakers, it was not evidence-based <laughs> policymaking. It wasn't that these policymakers had, had seen social science evidence that this or that civic integration policy would generate better outcomes. It was really an attempt to um, deflect what they viewed as a likely popular, they wanted to, to um, ensure that far right anti-immigrant parties didn't gain too much voting. And so they thought adopting these sort of more restrictive uh, civic integration policies would, would uh, assuage um, populist anxieties and deflect this perception that we're being too soft on immigrants. And it's really hard to, so, I mean, I, I think, I think you're right that, that, um, that there's a whole lot going on that is not based on uh, social science evidence. Um, but I guess, I, I guess my sense is that, um, I mean, I, I, so I, I guess is the way I see it is one political game going is going on is how do we how do we avoid a kind of far right populist how do we, how do we avoid that surge on a far right populism and that's a genuine question and it probably and it may in under some circumstances require us to kind of compromise what we view as ideal public policies because um, we don't want to do something that's just going to trigger a, a backlash that's going to make things worse. Um, but on the other hand, there also is a lot of, I think, genuine and sincere interest amongst both academics and policymakers and, and journalists and, and uh, uh, about what works. I think there's a genuine curiosity um, to know what kinds of policies are actually working. And, and to know that we need, we need, to, we need to actually you know, identify the policies. We need to then find, have some way of measuring them. And, and um, so I actually think there is a big audience still for, for evidence about what policies are working. And, and what, what Tom showed from the MIPEX data, I think it's all actually quite, quite reassuring that, that there's actually growing levels of social science evidence that some of the policies that we might think are good on kind of normative grounds are also quite efficient in terms of outcomes. So I'm still relatively optimistic about that. Okay, Thomas? So um, two points. So your question was kind of supposing that um, expertise was no longer making it into uh, policy discussions um, in a time of populism. Uh, well, to paraphrase uh, Donald Trump, there are fine experts on both sides. Um, so if you look at a lot of the intense populist policies uh, that are being adopted, those are also being adopted um, with quite a, a strong a deal of expertise, but where the vision of society and the goals being pursued are entirely different. Um, so I wouldn't argue that just because uh, our evidence um, about how you can promote um, societal integration, um, more equity in society is not being listened to doesn't mean that um, that, that evidence is not making it in. What is true, I believe, is that a lot of our evidence is not as uh, persuasive because, um, yes, as, as uh, I was pointing out, um, we're not very good at talking enough about, one, what are the effects of our policies and what are reasonable expectations uh, for what our policies uh, can achieve so that we actually give uh, uh, clear uh, solutions and wins uh, to politicians. But the other thing that's true is that um, we do not talk about our, our policies in ways that the normal person can understand. And I think that there are increasing research um, done with uh, conjoint analysis, so uh, experimental public opinion studies, where we're getting a much better understanding about how the public views very complex things like um, who should come here as an immigrant worker, um, who should uh, get asylum, um, who should become a citizen. And you actually see that um, the public can actually make very complex uh, decisions, but they're looking at factors um, that we wouldn't normally uh, focus on when we were describing our policies. 
Um, and I think that's maybe one of the weaknesses that we have is we come with assuming that our way of speaking and thinking about these issues is uh, the way that policymakers and the public should be educated uh, to speak and think. Um, but we are getting better at this, I would say, and um, I do hope that there'll be more research in this area. Uh, and then Enrico, and uh, Enrico, when you um, answer my question, um, I, I, I noticed that all of the indicators that you spoke about tracked Canadian experience over time. So in answering the question um, about the utility of these in a, in a skeptical age, could you also ask, uh, discuss the extent to which you use comparative indicators? Looking, you know, capturing the experience of other countries of the sort that, um, you know, sort of will, and, well, all of the commentators on the, uh, in this, this set of panels have been addressing, or whether most of the indicators and evidence you use, the driving in, in, a, in a policy context are domestic. Right. So uh, thank you. I think that's uh, a very legitimate question. And uh, I, I think that uh, I would uh, uh, sort of uh, support the view that uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, that uh, Will um, um, spoke about it. Uh, however, uh, from a government perspective, I think it reinforces the idea uh, that so uh, the indicators do not uh, measure uh, certain things, in this case, ethnicity, religion, and whatnot, because they are, in, in a sense, a lot more neutral. Uh, they end up being very objective. I also saw the question in, in the chat. And, uh, and, and uh, in so far as your question, Keith, about uh, comparing, I think that uh, the government of Canada does a lot of comparison uh, with other countries. But of course, uh, the primary objective of the immigration is to look at uh, how can a foreign national by coming here integrate into our society. So, you know, integration is a big word, but this is why we have settlement agencies that help with us. Um, throughout Canada, and, and they do a very good job at integrating. So um, while we do not measure certain indicators, uh, the uh, indicators are, uh, that we do use, the performance indicators are very objective, neutral, uh, but at the same time, when you are talking about integration in, into uh, society, uh, you know, you look at the uh, activities, the volunteerism, uh, the uh, connection with the community, and so on and so forth. So uh, I think the debate um, has to continue, the arguments, the supporting evidence within academia. But as far as government is concerned, I think uh, that um, the performance indicator uh, based on national needs are, are, are very important. I think comparison does happen. And uh, I think that this is all about uh, exchanging of ideas. And, and this is why Governor of Canada um, participates in, in various fora throughout the world. Um, and uh, we take lessons learned, but also a lot of countries want to learn from the Canadian experience. Okay, so I'm turning now to the questions from the audience and I appreciate, <clears throat> uh, or I hope you'll appreciate, we can't get all of the questions in. Um, if those of you who've been looking at the chat questions will see that a number of them are directed to Will and his uh, comments about the usefulness or otherwise of the constitutional protection of secularism. So um, it's difficult to draw them together, but um, I'll just draw on one of them, uh, or two of them. The first question is on... Um, says secularism can take two forms, one that protects the state against religion, the other protects religion from the state. Quebec is an example of the first, rest of Canada is more of an example of the latter. Can, lack of a constitutional statement would allow states to swing freely between these two without facing any constitutional resistance. So uh, uh, a defense of constitutionalism and then uh, a related one, uh, which is about the disentangling of normative views. Being more secularist is not necessarily a good thing and having a higher score does not mean that Canada is doing better. So do you wanna, Will, do you wanna wrap those two things together and um, say anything? 
you're not you're not obliged to you know you can just say no, I agree just, with everything I've said. Yeah, just a just a quick comment. I honestly think that secularism uh, is one of those terms in today's political climate that is just so politicized that um, it's. I think we need we need to immediately ask what it is. What, what is, what's the value or the principle that people are concerned about that they're expressing through the language of secularism? And so whenever, I think whenever we hear the word secularism, we need to ask people what they mean by it, why they think it's important. Um, and so the fact that we don't have uh, the word secularism, I, a constitutional statement of it, in my view, isn't a problem because the values that we're trying to protect through the word secularism are, I think, protected in the constitution. So that's including religious freedoms, including norms of equal citizenship, norms of non-discrimination, freedom of conscience. So these are all the kind of things, it's a package of values that, that, that get wrapped up in the label secularism. But I actually think that wrapping up into the label is unhelpful and counterproductive. And in today's climate, politicized in a way that's actually kind of increasingly toxic. Um, so I, I, I actually think we have more than enough constitutional protections um, to ensure that states don't you know, go all over the place here in Canada, either provincial or federal. Um, we'll see what, how, how the courts deal with the Quebec bill. But I, I don't think the problem is that we don't have enough constitutional protections. It's just that they take a form that's, at, as we're at a lower level of disaggregation than the word secularism. Okay, so let me um, ask, uh, I think I have time to squeeze one more question in, which has to do with the utility of uh, the sort of big comparative, cross-country comparative indicators that we've been looking at. And this is uh, a question for Thomas and for everyone. And that is, um, what, what is your reaction to the comment of Andrea earlier that we should only cluster and compare countries with significant commonalities? Yet in this respect, we've compared several EU countries today with uh, new host countries uh, like Canada and others. Um, is, would the utility of these um, comparative indicators be better if we didn't aim for a universal coverage, which seems certainly uh, in, the, in the, the pluralism index is certainly implicitly the goal, and rather um, concentrated on, on, on uh, clustering. And so I'll open that to all three. Um, in the case of uh, <clears throat> Enrico, maybe we could start there. If they were clustered, would they be of more use to people like you? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have that answer, uh, okay. and I'll be very honest. But I, I do, if I may, uh, have a comment on the uh, on the chat question about integration and assimilation. Um, and uh, when we talk about integration and assimilation, this is precisely why I mentioned the, uh, the BNB Commission because it argued in favor of integration, not assimilation. Um, and uh, in order to answer for that question, I would have to uh, have uh, a lot more uh, st substance. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, I will defer it to my colleagues. Okay, Thomas uh, <clears throat> uh, and Will, any views on the issue of clustering? I mean, I think that we, um, we'd actually need more global indexes before we can answer this, uh, this question. Um, people often say to me, yeah, but you should compare me to a country that has uh, a sim similar level of GDP or democracy or immigration or public openness. But actually, as we have more research, we are looking to see, well, are any of these things determinants of your integration policy? And even if they are a determinant, it might not be sufficient to predict uh, your approach to, uh, to integration, right? So, it is certainly helping us to see um, what relevant differences emerge. And as I said, I do think that your level of democracy, GDP, immigration, and public openness probably do um, strongly affect uh, your um, country's approach uh, to uh, immigrants. 
I think that when we have more global uh, indexes, it'll be really interesting to see if there's a strong regional dynamic because more global research finds that we have regional norm diffusion for whatever reason. So people are comparing themselves to people in their same region um, and are more likely to change their policy if a neighboring country uh, makes those changes. So it might be then more useful for policymakers to uh, see a, a better scoring country from their own region. But I think that um, when we come to these aggregate level indexes, we also just have to get better at explaining what we're measuring. So in this next version of MIPEX, we're gonna have the overall score, but we've also looked to see actually what really determines um, what uh, structures your country's integration policy. And we find that uh, policies are structured along three dimensions. So countries can grant basic rights to immigrants, they can grant equal opportunities to immigrants, and they can grant equal security to immigrants. And some countries do all three of those things. Let's see if Canada is one of them. Um, but there are many countries that do only two or one of those things. So there are even countries that try and promote equal opportunities for immigrants, but don't give them basic rights. So I think that we need to get better at understanding, you know, what are the policies we're looking at? What are really the dimensions that explain um, why countries have different models, if we're going to uh, eventually come there? Um, and I think that will help people to maybe think about how they want to change uh, their model at, their, at the time and who they could learn from. Okay, last word in this question to Will. Will, you are the co-director with some other nameless person uh, of an index which is highly clustered, right? You've only got, you've got liberal democratic affluent societies in the MCP index. Is that done out of some principled conviction that uh, clustering is critical or is it just a lack of resources for going beyond? Yeah, well, on the MCP index, it's just lack of resources. But I, I just agree completely with Thomas that we need we need to get the global indicate global indexes, and then and then figure out what kind of clustering makes sense. And I really worry about the idea that we would cluster. I think there's a danger of clustering, based on just kind of national mythologies or self images. Like we have an image of who our peer countries are, usually in a way that flatters us, and um, and then it would be a mistake, I think, to, to create clusterings that reflect a kind of pre-theoretical sense of who belongs with whom. Um, and that we should instead, yeah, as Thomas said, let's, let's get as many global indicators as we are and then just see what kind of countries actually cluster together. Uh, and there may be some genuinely surprising results from that. Yeah. Okay. Well, I apologize to others who have put in interesting questions. We didn't have time. We're actually over a little time. So I think it uh, remains only for me to thank our three uh, speakers for a, a lively session and to pass the parole over to Anna to close the session. Uh, thank you, uh, Keith. I uh, took advantage of my silent role to write in the chat box. Um, I think we've raised more questions than we answered, but it was a very interesting discussion, I think, truly uh, discussing how different indicators assess one country, but also how we compare among countries. And, and I think this question of clustering is not an easy one, as I wrote in the chat. We ended up moving Australia in the, in the Greece project that has countries from Western, Southern, Southeastern, Central Eastern Europe and Russia. Uh, Middle East, like North Africa and Turkey and Lebanon. And then we have India, Indonesia, and Malaysia. So really, and, and Australia. And we ended up bringing Australia, like towing away Australia from the Asia Pacific uh, next to the UK. And we're now contemplating since we've been able to add Canada, whether Canada and Australia, who are actually almost at the diametrical um, opposed geographical uh, places in the universe should be clustered together. And I think that, that, that says something about, you know, the, uh, the, the challenges and opportunities of clustering, but, but I do agree with the idea that we should think outside the box and not predetermine who compares with whom. And I think in that respect, the, um, what the Global uh, Pluralism Index tries to do is very important and very laudable even if we, we will hear and Kundan and colleagues can get a lot of criticism of how do you compare 
Kenya with Germany or I don't know which other country with which other country. And with that, I would like to thank you all for your perseverance and passions to stay with us for over two and a half hours. Uh, thank you very much for the very interesting presentations and comments and this, both of the discussions and of the audience. And um, as I think my colleague, Laura, who is our communications manager, will say, we'll, we'll include you in, in our mailing list and you'll hear more from us. Thank you very much and have a nice afternoon or evening.